Welcome into our new chapter, chapter 10 on nuclear chemistry. In this video, we'll introduce nuclear chemistry, we'll introduce a few different specific nuclear reactions, and think about their properties. We can start here with some motivation and maybe a little bit of history. We know that the Earth is around 4.5 billion years old. We know our oldest ancestor is about 3.2 million years old. We can find artwork from 40,000 years ago. We can find the Dead Sea Scrolls from approximately 1,900 years ago. All these things we know based on radiometric dating. We may have heard of this kind of carbon dating process, a way to accurately date things from thousands or millions of years ago. We'll try to build up an understanding of how and why this process works, but also look at some of the limitations. The Smithsonian is reporting that carbon dating might not be reliable within the next decade or so. In order to answer this question of how and why, let's get into some details on nuclear chemistry. Nuclear chemistry is a relatively recent field discovered in 1896. And this is a field that studies the nucleus of our elements. Almost all processes that we've looked at before have been dealing with the electrons in our atoms. When we form chemical bonds, when we do chemical reactions, we're not really messing with the nucleus. Instead, we're moving electrons from one species to another or sharing electrons to form covalent bonds, all of our favorite things. As it turns out, there are these classes of reactions that can mess with our nucleus, that can change the number of protons and neutrons within our elements. What that means is we can change even the identity of our elements when we're undergoing these nuclear reactions. This field was pioneered around the turn of the 1900s by Becquerel and later Madame Curie, starting with the discovery of the X-ray, but then moving on to the discovery of radioactivity, what we call alpha, beta, and gamma rays. For this work, Marie Curie won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903, and later on she won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering two new elements that also exhibit radioactivity, polonium and radium. With that background and motivation, we can get into some of the details. There are a few key types of radioactive processes that we want to go into the details of. We can talk about alpha decay, beta decay, gamma ray emission, positron emission, and electron capture. For our radioactive processes, we have unstable nuclei that will spontaneously undergo these decomposition reactions, changing the structure of those nuclei. Since we're talking about protons and neutrons changing in our nucleus, we're going to have to use our isotope notation for these nuclei. In this notation, we have our mass number to the top left of our chemical symbol and our atomic number to the bottom left of our atomic symbol. With this notation, we can specify exactly what nuclide we're talking about, where a nuclide is one specific nucleus with a certain number of protons and a certain number of neutrons. If we want to specify our subatomic particles, a proton has a mass number of one and a charge of one. Our neutrons have a mass number of one and a charge of zero. Our electrons have a mass number of zero and a charge of negative one. Positrons, maybe we haven't heard of these before. These are a form of antimatter, which we'll get into the details of just a little bit. Positrons are very similar to electrons. They have no mass number, but they have a positive charge. Imagine everything you know about electrons and only change the charge from negative to positive. That is a positron. A type of antimatter. Using this isotope notation is going to be extremely helpful. As we'll see in a moment, it will allow us to balance 
our nuclear reactions relatively easily. Our last bit of terminology before we jump into the types of nuclear reactions, we can call our parent nuclide our reactant in our nuclear reactions. This is our starting nucleus that will decompose into something slightly more stable. Our parent will turn into a daughter nuclide. This is the product in our nuclear reaction. It's going to be a little bit more stable than what we started with. We can try to study our types of radioactivity based on their relative charges and based on their relative masses. Ernest Rutherford did this experiment where he had a radioactive element in a device designed to emit our radioactivity in just one direction, essentially making a gun of radioactive particles. This beam of particles then passes through an electrical field. This electrical field has a positive end and a negative end. Any negative particles passing through will be dragged towards the positive side. Any positive particles passing through this field will be dragged towards the negative side, right? Opposite charges attract. Any neutral particles will reverse across unaffected by our electrical field. What Rutherford saw was three separate types of radioactivity. We have beta rays, we have gamma rays, we have alpha rays. The direction that they are dragged towards tells us the charge on that product. The amount that they are deflected tells us their relative mass. Heavy particles will be deflected less than our lighter particles. We'll start here looking at our alpha rays or alpha particles. These need to be positively charged particles and they need to be relatively heavy. And in fact, that's what is the case. Alpha decay produces alpha particles, which are particles with a mass number of four and a charge of two. This is exactly the same as helium. Our alpha decay process produces alpha particles, which are exactly helium nuclei. Our parent nuclide is going to give off this alpha particle, which will make it smaller by two protons and two neutrons. The effect here is that our daughter nuclide is lighter by about four AMUs, and it has two less protons. It's going to change the identity of this element. We can see an example here. If we have uranium-238, this can undergo alpha decay. It will emit this alpha particle, this helium nuclei. And what is left behind, the daughter, is going to be thorium-234. Since we lost two protons as part of this helium nuclei, we had to move two squares backwards on the periodic table. Uranium turns into thorium. Our mass number was 238 to start, but we lost two protons and two neutrons, and so our mass number for the daughter has to be 234. This is going to be how we balance our nuclear equations. All of our mass numbers need to add up. The mass numbers on the left have to add up to our mass numbers on the right. Likewise, our atomic numbers on the left need to balance with our atomic numbers on the right. 92 on the left has to be the same as well, 90 plus 2 on the right. We can use this to predict the identity of our products from these alpha decay processes. For example, what if we have polonium-216 undergoing alpha decay? Polonium is atomic number 84, so we can write, okay, polonium 216 like this, and it will decompose into a daughter nuclide and an alpha particle. You can either write alpha or He for helium, either way is okay. For our daughter nuclide, 
we have to make sure that our mass numbers and our atomic numbers are balanced. For our daughter, the atomic number has to be 82. Once we know the atomic number, we can identify the element. Element number 82 has to be exactly lead. Here are some things that we know about alpha decay. Alpha particles are really large. That means when an alpha particle is emitted and hits something, it can do a lot of damage. It has a high ionizing power. If there is decay going on within a living cell, this can cause some serious damage, right? We can damage our cells because they're being bombarded by these alpha particles. The flip side of that coin is our alpha particles are really big. They hit things really fast. That is to say, our alpha particles don't get to travel very far because they'll bump into things. If an alpha particle runs into a piece of paper, okay, it will hit that piece of paper and get stopped. Or even just traveling through air, after a few feet maybe, there'll be enough air particles that, okay, the alpha particle hits one of them and stops traveling so fast two sides of this coin. There's a lot of damage when a collision occurs, but there's less penetrating power. These alpha particles don't go too far before they do hit something and get stopped. We can move on to our second type of radioactivity from our diagram before. We can look at beta decay. Beta decay is when our nucleus emits an electron. Wait, this is a little bit weird. If you had a record scratch moment, where are there electrons in the nucleus? You're right, there aren't. There are not electrons living in the nucleus. But we can undergo a process that produces an electron within our nucleus. What happens is we have a neutron converted into a proton. When a neutron changes into a proton, we also get to emit an electron. What that means is, in our overall process, our atom loses a neutron, it gains a proton in that nucleus, and an electron is shot out into the world as beta emission, beta particles. That is how our nucleus emits an electron, not because it has one to begin with, but because we're doing this other conversion process. For balancing our reactions, we get to do the same things. Make sure your mass numbers stay balanced. Make sure your charge numbers, atomic numbers, stay balanced as well. We can see that in our example. Ra can be converted into Ac, going to the right on the periodic table by one element. When we do this, a neutron is converted into a proton. The mass number doesn't change but the atomic number does change. We lost a neutron, but we gained a proton. Okay, the same total mass number. In order for our atomic numbers to remain balanced, we have to give this electron out into the world, shoot it off there as beta decay. This is the hidden process that's going on inside of our nucleus in order to emit that electron. Beta decay gets to have less ionizing power than alpha decay. These are smaller particles. They're going to do less damage when they hit something. However, electrons are able to penetrate through more materials. And so this balancing act here, they do less damage when they hit things, but they're able to penetrate through more matter. Let's take a moment for a practice problem here. Let's write the beta decay for AC228. We get to start with AC228. We're producing this beta particle, which you can write either as E or as that beta. And then we have to write our daughter nuclide. In order for this to be balanced, we need to have a mass number of 228 and we need to have an atomic number of 90. This corresponds to element TH. The last process we can look at here from our Ernest Rutherford 
experiment is our gamma ray emission. Gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation. This is a form of light, very, very high energy light. There are a number of processes that will give off these gamma rays. Sometimes they go along with another radioactive decay process. For example, uranium-238 that we saw before, this undergoes alpha decay, but it also emits a gamma ray. Another process that forms our gamma rays is from antimatter colliding with matter. Antimatter is mostly the same as regular matter, but with usually one key difference. We saw electrons can be written E0 minus 1. Positrons are our form of antimatter, complementary to our electrons. They are like electrons, except positively charged. Whenever matter interacts with antimatter, it will annihilate. It will be a big explosive reaction, producing lots and lots of energy. In this case, our energy has to be in the form of gamma radiation. Once again, we can see that our nuclear reactions are balanced, both in terms of mass numbers and in terms of charge numbers. In terms of the damage that this gamma ray emission can do, our gamma rays have no mass or charge. Photons of light here will have the lowest ionizing power. And on the flip side, they'll have the highest penetrating power. They'll be very hard to block, but they'll also do the least amount of damage once they hit things. We've been dancing around positrons for a couple of slides here. Positrons, like we said, are antiparticles, antimatter versions of the electron. They behave the same way as electrons do, described by wave functions, living in orbitals exhibiting wave-particle duality, and all of that. The difference is that our positrons are positively charged and therefore will annihilate, will explode, whenever they get in contact with electrons. Our next nuclear reaction involves positron emission. Positron emission is when our nucleus in our atom emits a positron. Again, maybe we have this record scratch moment. There aren't positrons in our nucleus. We have protons and neutrons. But we can do this reaction on our slide here to produce a positron within our nucleus. Our reaction is turning a proton into a neutron. And when we do this, we also have to emit a positron. Our mass numbers remain balanced. Our charge numbers remain balanced. There aren't positrons living in our nucleus, but if we do this process, converting a proton into a neutron, we get to emit a positron from that nucleus. We end up with the same overall mass, one less proton, one extra neutron. Here's an example of a positron emission reaction. We have phosphorus turning into silicon, phosphorus 30 turning into silicon 30 by emitting a positron. A practice problem here, we write the nuclear equation for positron emission in potassium 40. We can start with potassium 40. We know that we're going to emit a positron. You can write this as E or as beta, either is okay. The mass number is zero, and the charge number is plus one for that positron. Based on this, we know what our daughter nuclide has to look like. It has to be this. The mass number is still 40, and now the atomic number is 18. This corresponds to argon. Our potassium is converted into argon, by undergoing this positron emission. Our final type of radioactive decay that we'll look at is known as electron capture. This is a little bit different than our other processes that we've seen so far. Here we have our nucleus absorbing a particle. 
our nucleus is going to interact with one of our core electrons and draw that electron into the nucleus. When our nucleus swallows this electron, it will combine with a proton to form a neutron. This is that process. We can see that our mass numbers are balanced. A proton plus an electron form a neutron. The mass numbers and those charge numbers are equal on both sides. When this happens, we get to form some ion with a vacant slot in our four orbitals. When that's the case, one of our outer electrons will drop down in energy level to fill that gap. And in doing so, it will emit some electromagnetic radiation. This electron capture, therefore, is oftentimes coupled with releasing x-rays. Here's what this might look like. We have Ru capturing an electron from its core orbitals, forming some Tc. The mass number remains unchanged. We're just converting a proton into a neutron. One last practice question here. If we have I111 undergoing electron capture, let's write this balanced nuclear reaction. Our iodine nucleus is going to capture one of its core electrons. And as a result, our daughter nuclide is going to be one atomic number smaller. The mass number will remain unchanged, but the identity of our element will change. This is our overall reaction. What we have is a proton and an electron converting into a neutron. And as we said, if you want to write E instead of that beta, that's fine. Beta and E are interchangeable here for electrons or positrons. All right, let's summarize here. We've introduced radioactive decay as a way to change the identity of our nucleus, changing from an unstable parent nuclei to a slightly more stable daughter nuclei. We introduced alpha, beta, gamma, positron and electron capture kind of processes. And we can use these to predict our products and write balanced nuclear reactions. That's where we'll stop for today. Thanks for being here. Please do let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.